here tonight to talk about lighting for television. And our goal through this series of seminars that we're going to be having is to let you guys get a window into different aspects of lighting careers that are available. We'll talk probably less about the technical aspects of lighting for television or lighting for opera and more about um, how the work is. What, what's the environment like? What kinds of things do you do? How do you find work? And some of the differences in the ways that you may be educated and the skills that you're gaining there. And then some of the things that you will learn as you start to step out into these different lighting fields. And we are really pleased to have a great panel with us tonight. Uh, we will have four lighting professionals with us. Right now we have three and we have a fourth one who's on his way who knew he was going to drop in a little bit. Who couldn't, want his, he couldn't find his link. I'm sending it to him right now. He's, oh, okay. I think Thank he's right to drop in and find the link. <laughs> okay, good. We'll, we'll get him in. We'll get him in quickly. Um, so I'm going to first allow our panel members uh, to introduce themselves because they're mixed within our, our grid of, uh, of squares here. But uh, we'll start with Cheryl. Oh, I knew you were going to come to me first. <laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm Cheryl Wisniewski. I work for the Lighting Design Group, which is a New York-based television lighting company. We have about 60 people on staff. Um, 30 to 35 are designers. We have a couple of gaffers and um, project managers, finance office, back office stuff. Um, I am a senior project manager. I've actually been with LDG now for almost 20 years. Um, started off as their second ever hire of an ALD um, for, for drafting and accidentally got roped into project management. And um, still, they're still telling me, you know, when it slows down a bit, we'll, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, get, we'll move you over. Um, but <laughs> hasn't slowed down except for COVID um, yet. And it's been great because so I was in, I was hired when there were 12 people on staff. And now we're, we're so much more. So it, it's worked out really well. So um, it's, it's great fun. I love it. We mostly do news. Um, sports, um, some some events, some uh, usually tied in with news and sports and some systems designs and installations. A um, little bit of architecture, usually when it has to do with a, a studio being built in a new building um, so that we get our hands in all different pots um, and we uh, and, and, and get to collaborate because with sports, you know, you've got one one group lighting the field of play and then you've got us lighting the broadcast. So it's um, it's really neat to get that give and take and, and work together. So that's, uh, in a nutshell, I mostly handle logistics and step in when somebody is, uh, and when we're short, short staffed in, in the design field or, um, or uh, you know, just, it needs to get done. And I, and I think that's the, the big thing about, about what we do is just it needs to get done and get it done. Um, I actually have a, I have a BFA from Otterbein University out in Ohio. And um, I plan to work a bit in New York and then move uh, and then go to grad school and that work a bit exploded and so I, I ended up instead of getting my mfa going for an mba and um and so it's a different way of looking at it so i'm, I'm probably the most non-traditional use of the degree in the panel um but it helps that's Just, perfect no it's great cheryl it's great uh and i love that you hit upon a theme that i was hearing last friday right away which was accidentally this happened and I ended up doing this because it's something that, that we, we hear a lot about as we go along. So we'll, it, we'll go next. Yeah, go ahead, sir. Go it ahead. really was accidental. Um, after 9-11, when there was not much theater work in New York, I went on AOL and, um, and to start sending my resume to any, you know, Google, I wasn't even Googling, there was no Google, searching up lighting companies and, uh, or architectural <laughs> firms, anyone that I could use my drafting for, just something. and. Uh, I happened to find LDG and sent my resume to the contact us link. Um, and, and it was a really bad website back then. And, uh, <laughs> but I kind of called the next day and it just, I just happened. So I, I often say it was an accident or right place, right time. But I was sort of recently corrected that right place at right time only works if you put the work in beforehand. So it's, um, mm -hmm. so 
don't sell yourself short. Yeah, you got to make sure Thank you're you there. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right, next we'll go to Mike Berger. Uh, all right, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Mike Berger. I'm a freelance lighting designer and lighting director based here in Los Angeles. Uh, the majority of my work falls under the category of what I would say is variety television. So that's award shows, uh, music competition shows, and, and things of that nature. Um, outside of that, I do a lot of work in kind of themed entertainment and theatrical live event endeavors. Uh, basically, I consider myself a designer of things that are live. So I, I love events that are live, I love theater that is live, television that is live, uh, things that have that kind of visceral uh, immediate reaction with your audience, whether that's 100 people in the room or you know 1.5 million people on TV. Uh, I fell into this also accidentally somewhat. I, like a lot of the students on this call, was you know interested in a theatrical degree. I was pursuing a theatrical degree uh, and wanted to do musical theater on Broadway. Um, I w went to a seminar that was run by uh, a couple of folks from Full Flood, um, and they kind of laid out how they deal with television lighting. And I thought that that was a, a different thing than I than I thought it was pr prior to that. You know, prior to that call, I was like, oh, TV is pointing a bunch of white light at people, and to some extent, that is still the case, uh, but. There, there is an entirely different kind of area of television, which is a lot more theatrical and a lot more uh, intriguing to the way that my mind works. And I fell in love with the process and specifically the pace at how fast it moves and how quickly you go from zero to 100 on a show uh, and then quickly you know, roll right into the next one. So that process and the way that my brain works really lined up well together and I just kept going. Um, unlike Cheryl, I don't, I don't have a relationship with a particular company. Um, I work as a freelance designer. So basically anyone that calls, uh, I will, I will pick up the phone and answer. And, uh, that provides a really nice kind of diversity in the sort of work that I get to do. Thank you, Mike. And Bob, Bob Barnhart next. Hi, sorry, I missed you on Friday. I was uh, finishing a TV show. So um, let's see, well, I live in Pasadena, that's where I am right now. And uh, I went to school in Chico, Northern California. And I did uh, basically two years at Chico State and then got a scholarship to finish up at uh, CalArts. That's when I moved to Southern California. Um, the scholarship required me to be a technical director, uh, but the scholarship, I would have been a seamstress if that's uh, all it required. So um, I moved down to LA and I uh, started working before I even graduated. Uh, we were doing like uh, music videos and things like that, and just getting hired to work in the art department. And then I um, actually got a job working with uh, Flying by Foy before I graduated. I actually missed my graduation day because I was doing my first Peter Pan. Um, and I worked for Foy for about seven years, not full time, but a lot. And on uh, in between that, I was getting jobs, whether it be driving a prop truck to go pick up props at Paramount Studio and deliver them somewhere. Um, some people got me some lighting work, um, did a lot of rigging, and a uh, show called up. I didn't know them at all. Someone recommended that I could go hang their pipes for their you know, for a sitcom, and it paid four times the amount I had been paid yet per day. And they're okay to come in one day. I thought, yeah, I'm okay to come in one day. I'm going to buy a couch. Um, Finally, after seven years. So uh, I went in purposely wearing a white t-shirt, hoping that I'd walk out the dirtiest person on the crew and proving it. Um, by lunch on that first day, they asked if I wanted to come back tomorrow. And by lunch on the second day, they asked if I wanted to work on the series. And all of a sudden, a guy that went to school for theater and knew he was going to work in theater, didn't really care what I did. I just liked the business. Um, found himself on the lighting crew. Um, on a sitcom working three days a week on a show called It's Gary Shannon. So your parents are probably going to be young to know. But um, I moved over to Married with Children. And uh, during that one year of Married with Children, I met a famous lighting designer by the name of Bill Clages. And Bill literally invented lighting for television because he was an engineer when cameras were invented for live broadcast. And uh, we got to know each other. And uh, I had just invented my first hand tool, which is called a pin splitter. And Bill was really into uh, making AutoCAD work for light plots, which no one had ever heard of at the time. 
Um, and he said, if you're really into theater, why aren't you doing television specials? What are you doing in sitcoms? Because as Mike said, it's like throwing a lot of white light at things. Um, and if you're, you know, if you really like theater, then you're going to like television specials a lot better, which are the same things Mike described, like, you know, Super Bowl halftime show or Academy Awards or a lot of music specials. Um, Miss USA, Miss Universe type things. They just did a Carrie Underwood um, Christmas special. Um, two weeks ago, I finished a uh, Rihanna Savage uh, Fenty show on Amazon, which is a really, it's a really cool project and not normal, which is fun. So uh, Bill took me into his company uh, and I started working in television specials as an electrician and a gaffer and then um, started working with Bob Dickinson a lot, who ended up leaving that company. And I got for him, and then I kind of developed a position that seems to be on every show now called a lighting director, which is a closer than maybe just an assistant would be. You're kind of the eyes and ears on the floor when uh, the lighting designers, you know, in the control booth or video truck. Um, anyway, so that's pretty much where I am now. I've been a full-time lighting designer since 1997. I've done 21 Super Bowl halftime shows, about 20 Oscars, um, a lot of music specials. Uh, consult for uh, Ellen DeGeneres and Barbara Streisand often, and I uh, never thought I was going to be doing television lighting, but it's, as Mike said, it's very theatrical. I love how it comes and goes in the week. So no matter how bad the politics are, we can get through it, just suck it up, get through it, and, uh, you know, move on to the next job with, with other people. I do like that it changes a lot. I did a lot of theater growing up, and I like theater, but... Um, I like this uh, television area that I've kind of landed in. Thank you, Bob. Well, those are very interesting introductions. You know, you coming at it from from different angles, but with a, a common theme, which was applying, you know, the the training that you got in theater into the television environment. So, tell me about that transition. I mean, Bob, you just kind of gave us a nice description of of how you went from point A to point B. How did you did you learn the technical skills that you needed to uh, uh, change from your theater type background and education to the camera? Um, did you learn those as you went on the job? How did those come about? Well, I mean, I've also worked on a couple of motion pictures as an electrician and, and film is the only um, industry that are part of our entertainment industry to me that's not theater based because there's no performance for anybody but the actors and maybe the director of photography. So I really kind of got turned off by it. So to kind of reinforce the point, you know, theater is the oldest bit of entertainment out there. And I think going to school for theater is the best thing you could do um, because it's the foundation of what everything else that we do is based on. So it's like good basic training to go into theater. So when you transition into other parts, let's say television or television specials, there really isn't that much more to learn. You can pick up pretty quickly. You know, the lighting to the human eye opposed to lighting to the camera eye is the only thing you really have to learn. That might sound like, oh, that's a lot to learn. It's actually not a lot to learn. I do a a lecture on it for schools all the time. You can do it in less than half an hour. The other half hour is just to fill this space. So I found the transition is pretty easy. You know, that I'll just leave it at this. Your key to success is going to be your attitude, work ethic, and personality. Your skill set is expected at the professional level. And if you're being transitioned or brought in, and I know you're a student or whatever, people are going to have the patience to teach you the skill set. They can't teach you the attitude, work ethic, and personality. So if you come in with that, that's really all you need. And I know you spent a lot of money four years of college to find out that that's actually what it's But at the end of the day, you're at the professional level, your skill set's expected. So work work on you and how you come across and how you handle problems and how you handle pressure. And you'll, you'll be much more successful than you think. And Cheryl, you described coming into LDG, you know, when it was, I think you said 12 people or something. and And now so much bigger and it sounds like you're you came in with the intention of staying for a little while and leaving but speaking to what bob said you got drawn in and they drew you in and, and kept you in so tell us more about that sucker um <laughs> so it was it was really i was expecting to be hired you know on a freelance basis to do some cad work or something to that effect but they um they they sort of took their first or I guess at that point, their sort of second step of growth. And they had had an ALD, but they, uh, but he was about to move out into the field and they needed backfill because before that, all the LDs handled their own drafting. And, um, and so they 
So they realized, oh, if we promote him, what are we going to do? And so I thought I was just going to be drafting a little bit. Um, one of our one of our big clients is NBC Sports, and so we handle all of NBC's uh, lighting for the Olympics. And they, it was 2002, Salt Lake City. Their project coordinator, who basically ordered gear and booked crew, and that was it at the time. Um, and was going out to Salt Lake City, and they realized, well, we brought her in, and on her resume, she's fronted shows before, and she's she's made all these arrangements. She could she can do that, and um, and I was young and naive enough to say, yeah, no problem, okay. Um, and uh, so I did. And when he got back, he left from from Salt Lake. He left the company, and they were like, can you just keep doing this for a bit? Um, and it was really challenging, and it was fun, and it was um, so different. It wasn't something I'd ever considered doing. At all, I mean, it was theater or bust, um, and, and and there wasn't much going on, so it was it was it just seemed like okay, I got a paycheck in. After after I they called me to offer me the job, I called my mom. I said, "Mom, four hundred one k and health benefits." Like, never expected. Um, so we, so part of it was that security that lured me in, but it was also things were just really exciting and it was big and it was um, it was fascinating. Also, very very stressful high highs, low lows. Um, but that, that, that dig in and get it done thing is, is just is what juices me, I guess. And so, um, and that, that challenge, um, but it, and it's, and it really is, as, as Bob said, all about the attitude. I think those that, that stay with us and that, that really succeed, um, may not have the mo most technical skills when they get here. Like I, I carried a Matthews, uh, catalog on the train with me every day before and after work and studied grip gear because we don't do grip gear in theater. And I was like, TVM what? Um, and, uh, and so those little things that you can do that, you can figure that out. Um, but my the first job I worked on was actually a, a dog show in Connecticut. And, um, and I, and I was just like, um, isn't that in a big arena? Oh, you do have to do stuff for that. Okay. So I called, um, I guess Altman and probably fourth phase at the time, I think it was, 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 and said, who do I talk to? And I got on the phone with Keith Romain and John Carver and I said, okay, what do you need from me to, to tell you what I need? Cause I, this is all I know. And, and they were, they loved it. They were like, here, okay, so do this and fax, fax this to me and, you know, and then we'll talk and then we'll, you know, and it was really, it was really like a group effort to bring me into the TV fold because they were like, aren't you cute? Um, but really, it's really, that's, that's kind of the environment that we all work in. We've all been there. And it's, it's kind of exciting to see that there are students out there who are specifically thinking about doing this because, you know, back in my day, we didn't have, we didn't, you didn't go to school for, for TV lighting. You, you knew somebody who, who worked for one of the networks or, or, uh, or your parent, your, your father was in the union. So you went into the union and, and was just, almost dumb luck um so so seeing that it's like people are realizing it's real and like i could do this it's like that juices me that was my big takeaway on friday it was wow it's like it's not just by accident anymore um and uh so that's a that's i think that's a big step for for our industry very so, good mike could, mike talk about your uh, talk about your early introduction and kind of coming into this side of the industry Sure. Uh, you know, as I mentioned coming in, um, it, it was frankly something I wasn't interested in doing, which is like a, a funny, you know, caveat to the story. The the it was Bob uh, Dickinson who had come to school and invited us to see the Kennedy Center Honors. And I was like, oh, that sounds like a lot of fun and a, and a way to kill the weekend. So I'll go and do that. And that was interesting. So I called him up after and I was like, hey, could I you know, do something again with you? And he's like, well, do you want to come do the Tony Awards? Uh, and me at the time as a theater kid was like, yeah, done. No problem. That sounds awesome. Um, so at that point, I had, you know, it, like a visit and an internship under my belt. And I did one or two more internships. And that was middle of senior year. And at that point, you, you know, he and I had a conversation where he was like, well, I can't tell you to move to LA, but if you move to LA, there might be work opportunities for you. Um, so I took that risk and immediately had three and a half weeks of nonstop work and then three months of absolutely no work. 
and thought that I had made the worst decision I've ever made in my life. Um, because at that point I didn't quite realize that, you know, he has, he has this like, you know, schedule during the year where he's busy and not busy. Um, and that three months he was not busy and it didn't matter. But to me, it was, uh, it was a pretty big deal. Um, so I, you know, I worked with them as an assistant and, you know, kind of worked my way up to the lighting director position. And I would say probably about two years ago have really started to move out on my own and try to take, uh, some lighting design jobs as, as much as possible. Um, and, and still supporting the designers that I've worked with in the past as a lighting director. Uh, but, you know, really trying to move more into that designer chair. Um, yeah, did that, uh, sorry, I got a little off track. Yeah, that answer no, the question no, there. No. <laughs> Great answer. And, you know, Bob mentioned, uh, this position of lighting director and then the position of lighting designer has come up. I mean, Bob, speak a little to what those two positions are, how they differ and work together. First of all, so it doesn't drive me crazy. Jake, didn't I meet you in, were you at uh, University of North Carolina when I came in? No. There? That's what I thought, okay. I kept looking at like, how do I know too? Um, I was trying to pull up your play bill just because I, I missed Friday, unfortunately. Uh, anyway, um, so there's a lot of positions that uh, Mike and I use on these types of shows, of course. Um, then quite often there's at least one lighting director in that position really, um, you know, just let's say when we're on camera working backwards, uh, that, that position would be uh, looking to do any of the fixed light focuses, um, solve little problems with the stage managers or the scenic people or whatever's going on, while the lighting designer's trying to work with, you know, let's say the programmers at the consoles, which we also call lighting directors, and I'll get into that in a second. So that lighting director is really kind of uh, an, a really, I would say, an assistant lighting designer is you know one way to look at it. Um, we also have a lighting director position that we'll use in terms of might do the drafting of this of the show and then bring that through all the way through the install. That might be the same person I just described. It might be an additional person. Uh, like I said, we um, describe our programmers as lighting directors because uh, at least the, the way I know Mike and I work. Um, they're a big part of the creative process. I'm not telling them, take this channel to 24 and record. I wouldn't even know what words to actually use if I had to tell them that. Um, so I'm much more focused on trying to paint a picture in their head. And then they use their skills of using that console and the lights we've given them. And then they paint that picture the way I've got it into their head, but in their interpretation, just as if you worked with a person that could sketch really well, and you said, draw a cartoon that does this, their cartoon is going to be much better than your cartoon, but you gave them the inspiration and the idea, so that working together, that collaboration gets us there. Then you might just actually have an assistant who might be uh, more in charge of maintaining paperwork and grabbing everybody's headsets and just kind of like being in front of things and, and making th taking things off your plate that they can take off your plate and they're on their way to becoming a light director. We quite often at 22 degrees uh, have one, at least one intern in our hopper. Um, so that we've always got, you know, somebody going and see if they're going to really want to get into this TV thing and see if they like it, see if it, you know, it, it fits them. And it's a, it's a fast moving business and there's a lot of pressure because we do live live and we do it once. So there's just a lot of pressure amongst the production company the network and all that this one time it's got to be great it's not like you know the saturday matinee didn't go that well but i'll get kathy to the uh, mantle um saturday night and i'll be okay you know you miss it once you missed it every time um so there's those positions from the board operator up and and you can get to those positions from drafting you can get those positions from being an electrician on the crew from being the gaffer on the crew i came in through gaffing a lot of the lighting designers that we have came in through being a programmer uh, Mike kind of came in through being an intern, right? So, I mean, th there's a lot of avenues there, and I think, you know, it's not one way to get anywhere. So, it's, I mean, that is good news if we came across that. Very good. And then, Cheryl, you started right off today telling us that you were a project, did you say a project manager? Mm -hmm. And And tell us more about that role at LDG and what kind of responsibilities you have. We are more along the lines of what I would say would be an associate in theater, kind of, sort of. 
um, in that we pick up uh, all the, the the tasks that the you know to support the LD uh, on site so that they can concentrate on the design. Um, but you have to add in into the mix the logistics, the the getting the gear there, getting the the crew, getting the right crew, um, and um, and and keeping the schedule and convincing the client that that your schedule is better than theirs to get what they want and 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 a lot a lot of of that client management the money talks we we keep the money talks to us so that the LDs don't they're not on site right in front of a client and the client says how much are you charging me for this um, they have that out that we're the we're the money people and and they're the art of it um, and it's and it it can keep them focused on what they're doing and in the best relationships i think project manager to to ld at ldg it ends up being that you can switch places and the ld is the boss at times and other times i'm the boss um and that and when the transition is really smooth uh, it doesn't matter who they call as long as you know one of you knows everything about every project and can answer those questions or make them think you've answered the questions while you while you're frantically sending text messages um but it really is a lot of of paperwork 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 and and always knowing other everybody else's lives and needs and and anticipating them um going into a new space you know what 100 questions are, do you need to ask on a survey to um to to make sure you know if that if you're going into the natural history museum you can't take a tall truck in you can't they have to be the stubby trucks um you know, you've got to know that inside and out. And that's it's, it's ridiculous stuff that just stays in your head um, that we try not to bog down uh, our LDs with. Um, and because they can jump from job to job, you know, one job on Monday and another job on Tuesday. Um, and so we're sort of that, that foundation for them you know, to keep it all straight and keep them going to the right place. It's, a, it's, it's interesting to it's so many different designers at once. And you know, Bob. Bob said, "I think everybody should be educated in theater. It's the best thing in the world to be educated in." And I've always uh, agreed with that because you know, I'm I was educated in theater. I got a master's in lighting design, and I ended up at a company like ETC. After a few years of doing lighting design, I kind of realized I was more interested in the hardware than I was in the actual process of doing the design. I like the stuff that was making it happen, and I found that there were these careers over here on the on the equipment side. And I ended up getting into sales positions and marketing positions. And along the way, at times I felt like, am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? But I always was. I mean, I was I was thrilled to be working with the people that I was working with and having the relationships that I had and being able to help in the way I was helping at that time. Um, so I think being open to going these different directions, you know, you don't know where your skills can take you until you get in a situation where you're suddenly something that needs to be done and you're the person who ends up doing it. And next thing you know, it becomes a career. Yep. I, I get asked a lot, what is it that makes you so successful that I'm the longest project manager at the company and sort of wrote the book on what it is we do? Um, and I say all the time, because we don't hire enough theater majors. We sat, hire people with production skills who have who have been and worked in the production offices or as a PA on a, on a on another show. That's not the skills that make me successful. It's that it's that process oriented job function versus the creative job function. Yes, I do spreadsheets all day long. Yes, I can crunch numbers in my head and, and I know how many foot candles this light you know can can produce. But it's the putting it together and and taking the little bits of things and, and making something new. That's, Okay, that is important. So, absolutely, that that theater degree, you've touched everything. You know how it all works, and you can pull it apart and put it back together into something brand new. That's the that's the the, the thing that we we call it the get it factor. There's so often we're like, man, he doesn't get it at all, and you, it's hard to define what it is. But it's that, and I I swear it's the theater degree. I agree. So I want to take a break for some questions. We've been talking around this this range of opportunities. I also want to acknowledge Jeff Rabbits has joined us. Hi, Jeff. I hope you can hey hear there. us. Thank you for joining. I, I feel can like hear you. Getting, we can hear you too. So we're getting a I'm tour of your good. venue. What are you working on today, Jeff? Give us a clue. 
Is it well? Is it secret, or can it can it be talked about? <laughs> it, it's not secret. No, it's an interesting show. Um, for, we're we're shooting four acts over three days uh, for uh, a, a live stream that's going to happen sometime in the next couple of weeks, and. Um, we were shooting two acts today, so we just finished one. I apologize for being late, uh, but it's an, it, it's at the Troubadour in L.A. Uh, famous venue, uh, not very well equipped, and they don't allow any uh, any lights to be added to their overhead rig. So we brought in a bunch of floor lights and some stands and trees and booms and so forth so that we can move it around act by act and have as much variety, make the place look really enormous um, and uh, uh, make make the best of, of the rest of the, the house equipment. So that's it. So we just <laughs> finished uh, uh, show one, a little break, and then we'll get back to show two. That's great. Well, I'm opening it for questions from the students about what you may have heard about uh, so far. If there's anyone you wanted to ask anything of, good time to unmute yourself. And, and Jake, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Awesome. Um, so I noticed all of you kind of mentioned the same general idea of stress and fast changes. Um, obviously, I think coming from a theater background, we all understand that stress and the fast paced aspects of it. Um, because this is your career, how do you kind of manage that? Like, how do you sleep at night kind of deal? Like, do you stop thinking about this? Is there a way you turn this off? Or is this just constantly going? Anyone want to take that? How about it, Mike? Sure, yeah. Um... I'd say the the first the first piece of that when we talk about pace in theater versus talking about pace in television, uh, they really are two different things. Um, I mean, you are you are taking a show that could have from like, just purely from a lighting standpoint, twenty five hundred moving lights, uh, loading it in, programming it, doing the show, and striking it in a span of twelve to fourteen days, um, and that is at the long end uh, of a process. So that's, you know, relatively unheard of as far as theater goes. Um, as far as how you take that and kind of turn it on or off, um, the, the, what I love about TV is that you do have those moments where it, it does kind of go into a depression of sorts of like, you, you really aren't working this week. And yes, you're taking some phone calls and yes, you're responding to emails and you, you have to kind of gauge for yourself what out of office means to you. Um, and, and for me, that's kind of like looking at the phone, seeing who's calling and also looking around and seeing where I'm at. If I'm on the golf course and it's not an urgent call and I know it can be, you know, called back in two or three hours, then I'll wait. If it's something that's really important, uh, I'll take it now. Um, it, you, you really just have to kind of balance for yourself that, that work-life balance. And I think that's something that probably all of us would would chime in on that that that's a thing that you really have to develop and say you know when you are stepping away from work and when you're letting that kind of take over your life yeah i i basically agree I, I, i'm like i'm just i'm always thinking so as soon as i wake up in the morning whatever that actually means whether it's on purpose or not i'm done and there's no going back to sleep the brain just starts going i'm always trying to think what did i forget about what am i what do i need to invest today when we go into work what am i not thinking of what could go on, what should the guys be ready to do you know it's hard not at least for my person i not to do that so i highly recommend i don't i've never been married and i don't have kids but i highly recommend getting married and having kids or anything that pisses you off when you get home so that you forgot about work for a while <laughs> need that distraction like i i play golf which won't be happening for the next three months but um you know, golf is only a great distraction because by the third hole, you're so pissed off at your golf game, you forgot about, you know, the job that you've been worrying about. So it's, it is good to have some type of distraction. As Mike said, it's not like, you know, you go in to a queue building session and everybody turns all the work lights off and they're nice and quiet and you're going to work on Act 1. You're building all your looks while audio is loading in, while they're putting band gear in. Half the time... The 45 minutes that band gets to rehearse their song is the 45 minutes you're building their look. You won't see it again until dress rehearsal, and then when everybody else sees it, why they won't. So it, it is a matter of uh, working really fast. I would say it's probably 
I don't mean this in a bad way at all. Um, it's probably the sloppiest art form in the entertainment business, television specials. Because you don't, you don't have time to sand it with fine sandpaper. Um, so you're, you're always pushing that last percent, always pushing, trying to get that last 10% so it looks a little bit cool. That's why that Rihanna uh, project I just did, which still was under the gun, we worked really fast, was such a different project that it was, it was fun when it was described to me in May. Um, you know, when the week you're there, it's like a blender I'm curing. But we put out a different type of product that I'm normally putting out, which is fun. And you, I like the term fine grit sandpaper there because I think we were hearing Jeff Ravitz talk about rough grit sandpaper when he talked about bringing in a bunch of stuff and moving it around to try and make the place look big, right, Jeff? I mean, yeah, exactly. Painting with a and broad stroke. Very broad stroke. And uh, certainly we're working on acts that uh, we've had no prior information about. So when I went home last night, um, I had seen bits of today's act set up and it posed all kinds of problems. Where was I going to position key lights? How was I going to get backlights on this brand new show? We had just finished doing another one. And that's what sort of ran through my brain all night. Uh, so, you know, I need to find a way to sort of gaze off into space and turn it off just so that I can clear my brain enough, be relaxed enough to come in and do my best the next day. So uh, mm -hmm. that's an important thing to, rem to remind yourself of. Other questions? Yeah, Melanie, go ahead. Michael, you can go next, Rathbun. Um, So my question kind of has a little bit to do with what Jeff was just talking about, and it kind of has two parts. So one, um, if anyone would be able to kind of just like describe the process that a televised wedding designer goes through, like whether it be research or plot or if any of that stuff is even relevant and kind of go off that, like I know as theatrical designers, I know a lot of my work is based off of emotional response, storytelling, those kinds of things. So when you're when you're trying to design for a televised show, like what are the things that are going through your mind? Are you thinking about visibility, effects? Like how do you create that palette or that those decisions for what to put on stage? A great question. Who wants to take that? I'll, I'll start it. I, um, we did the same exact thing that you just described that you did. Um, the, only thing I think we're going to do, and Jeff, Michael, everybody chime in. But I think the only thing I'm going to do differently is the camera has a 500 to 1 contrast ratio. The human eye's got a 2,000 to 1 contrast ratio. Um, you, at a live show, dictate the focus of the audience. On our shows, the director dictates the focus on the audience. So what I'm going to be looking at, in addition to everything you just said, same motivation, same emotion, all of those things, I'm looking for them too. I'm going to be looking at what is my weakest link? So what would be a weakest link? Maybe a projection screen. And it's not going to be able to get very bright. So I'm going to bring all my light levels down into a 500 to 1 contrast for the show to deal with that weakest link. Or what do I not have control of? Maybe it's an outdoor show during the day. So I'm going to be dealing with the sun. So now I've got a part that's so you're not going to really worry about that as much as I'm going to be worrying about that exposure level because I got it. I'm lighting to a, to a camera eye. You're mostly lighting to a human eye right now. So those are the only things I'm looking at maybe differently. I'm going to be thinking color temperature, what's white going to be and why? Is it a Russian palace with a lot of candles? My color temperature is going to be low. Um, we can get temperature if you're interested in it, but without getting too technical. But if I'm going to be in a, in a you know, outdoor environment, I'm going to be in 5,600 Kelvin because that's the natural light that's going to be you know, ambient to me. So I'm thinking about those things in addition to finding motivation, finding like what, what kind of signatures would, would my lighting look give to the show? How can I help enhance this show? And I, I want to ask Jeff uh, Ravitz to respond to this because Jeff, I think part of, we, we kind of introduced ourselves and, and laid the ground at the beginning. I think part of what you've kind of specialized over the past number of years is moving things from live into the televised environment. So this question of Melanie's might apply to you, especially there. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I've certainly screwed myself sometimes the way I've designed my live shows when they need to be transferred to uh, 
and, and adapted for television. Um, uh, over the years, I've learned how to not make that mistake and start with something that works good for the for uh, the live audience and for the for the camera. Um, and that that's been a learning process over the course of my whole career. I think really to. Uh, to speak to your your specific questions about emotion versus uh, versus the nuts and bolts. I mean, I think that for any show, whether it's live or televised, but especially for television, you have to work out the basics. You know, you need to know that you've got everything on stage covered in in the in the proper way. Um, uh, you know, key lights, backlights, scenery audience architectural uh depending on the kind of show it is it could be any any or all of those things once you have all of that in place and then you've also added in things that you know are going to be lush and give 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 you that emotional uh uh foundation that you need uh, you know to to create the, those sorts of of cues you know you've got the building blocks. So that's what I always do. I kind of start by providing myself the, with the basics of angle and intensity and color and, uh, and covering everything on stage that needs to be covered. And then I know that somewhere within that, I'm going to be able to extract that emotional reaction to what's happening on stage, whether it's an opera or a rock show or, you know, uh, uh, or an awards show kind of answer your question and, and, and the close-up we all and, deal with extreme things. Mm -hmm. you can sit in the front row of a black box theater you're never as close as that camera is when it's this close and the amount of detail you see in someone's face we're, we're going to be more worried about that primary key light especially if we're working with somebody who cares about how they look and they all do <laughs> it so needs to be said cheryl yes <laughs> Whether it's no, I don't dye my hair brown. Um, yeah, ladies more than men, but yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Bill, 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 Clay just, Bill Clay just has got a couple of great stories about that. Um, Michael Rathbun, I think you had a question. Yeah, I we had a lot of dis I had a lot of distorted audio there. Yeah, uh, I, I did too. It wasn't. Uh, were you asking me? So I, and I think the gist of the question was designing with the eye in mind versus designing with the camera in mind and making that transition. Well, and, I, and I'm curious, Michael, if I answer your question, too, because I think one of the problems that we all run into with our producers are they want the live audience to really, really enjoy the show because the artists need that feedback. And, you know, like Jeff was saying, he's going to light a Bruce Springsteen concert for an arena. Bruce going to be 80 to 100 foot candles. But when he's doing it for television, it's probably going to be 30 foot candles uh, for better balance. So um, we went into this fight with our producers, not really a fight, but, you know, they wanted to be good for the audience. I will just say this, the human eye is so good that once you're in a dark room for a long time, the room's not that dark anymore. So I don't think most of the audience um, loses the enjoyment. I've had people stop me at the airport before the day after a Super Bowl, you know, they're wearing a swag or something. That, and they said, oh, look great, look great. I said, you're in the stadium. Like, could you see Gaga? Could you even see her? And they're like, what kind of hard to see her? And I'm like, oh, bet it was. 50 foot candles and you were 50 feet away if you had a good seat. So, but, you know, I, I go for the bigger audience every time. If we're doing a television stuff, I'm going to go for the bigger audience. And 60,000 drunk people are not there half, half a billion people. So I'm not sure if I answered your question totally, Michael. I don't want to say we blow off the audience. We don't blow them off at all. Actually, one thing that's been kind of nice, I don't know how you guys feel, it's kind of been nice not to have to deal with an audience right now. That Rihanna project we did never would have been that way if we were in an arena with an audience. It just never would have been able to be. We were that scene, if you watch it, the garden scene with the tree. Has eight foot candles with a key light. The human eye hardly sees it. Everybody kept walking in, going, "When are you going to light it?" It's like it's lit. Just get on camera. Yeah, it's well, amazing I, what the cameras can do as well as a human eye. It's funny because I, you know, Bob, you kind of 
you know, hit the nail right on the head there with producers, even in the last, I would say, five years about not only does the artist on stage want it to feel like their rock show, but the producer wants to feel more like they are at a rock show uh, sometimes than what the TV show looks like. Uh, and, and often I find it's a lot of our job to like kind of take the, them from looking at this and point it down at the monitor and be like, no, 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 your audience is here. Like hit the, hit the multiple million of people that see this, not the 20,000 people that see this. Uh, and that's, I, I think, the big difference between when you're designing something that is live versus designing something that is televised. I love to do that. I love to take a picture of the monitor with the, with the, the stage or the show or the set behind it so that you get that contrast and um and that that's what i show my kids when i when i send them pictures like yeah you know, look at this this is what you're seeing this is what i'm seeing this is what you're seeing and it's and they they enjoy that because it's sort of that it's an extra sneak peek but it's it can be very dramatic that the difference yeah. and, but i think that the best lds that i know and i and i guarantee those on this call really um you you use that monitor to uh, after a while to, to double check yourself because you start to you start to feel it in the in the way that you're used to seeing it and I, so i um it's it's neat you know you, you think about having to light the shadows that you wouldn't light uh, otherwise necessarily so that, it, so that you can you don't know, get these black voids but after a while I, I suspect all three of you can see that without going how does that void look on the camera you look at that and you say there's no way that's reading and you can just feel it so it, it starts to become just part of that feel of as a designer too um, so while it can start off with numbers, it, it, I think you, you grow into that too. Yeah, also, the yeah. live audience is getting a much better experience than you are at home. You're in the room, you're feeling, yeah. you're feeling all of it. You're literally feeling the audio. So I don't think the live audiences suffer. It's just not the way you would like if that's all you were going to do. Because you'd also be directing, because remember, right? And the camera's doing that for us. But I think the live audience usually experiences a great show when they go to something like the BMAs or the Grammys. A totally different show than what you experience at home. Interestingly yeah. enough, one of the one of the things that can be uh, the most disconcerting for a designer that makes a transition from doing live to television is that day that you uh, that you watch the show only from the truck, where you call the foul spots only from the truck. It's like, oh my god, you know, I'm not going to be in the room watching, feeling, seeing the seeing the overview. I'm going to be in the truck just seeing what the cameras allow me to see. Well, that's your job when you're doing. When, when you're the television lighting designer, you need to see what the viewers out there in the world are seeing. And so you get yourself accustomed to really understanding what things look like on the monitor and not being tempted to look at the stage and seeing something completely different. So that's kind of important. And I think after a while, I think all, all of us have spent some time with meters in our hand, getting a sense of how many foot candles and what color temperature. And then you get to the point where your eye does begin to understand if you forgot your meters one day, that could be a problem, but you probably, you know, if you're experienced enough, get through the situation just by your experience, uh, your experienced eye. Um, and I'll just say one thing, you know, you talk about uh, foot candle levels on stage. I would venture to say that most rock shows, especially big shows on a stadium show or an arena show, the levels on somebody like Bruce Springsteen might be 200 or more foot candles because a lot of lights are piled on from different directions and you get a moving light that's that's not particularly far, if it's just overhead, even on a 25 or a 35 foot truss, and it's at full intensity. And most most concert LDs run everything at full intensity. They don't know how to dim anything down. And, and, and then there's three lights on them. And I had a programmer that always put extra lights on because he was always afraid something was going to burn out. When I caught him doing that, I had to, you know, sort of untrain him from, from doing that. But yeah, you're easily going to get up to the two or 300 foot candle level. Bringing that down to 80 or 50 uh, is not an easy thing. And when you're in a stadium where you think, well, yes, we could light this entirely for television and the people in the back of the stadium wouldn't have a prayer of seeing the show. So I find myself raising the levels a little bit um, to try to find some way to make it viable for 
audience. It's never quite the same as when you're not concerned with cameras. But what show these days doesn't have cameras and screens? Uh, not many. Very good point. Hannah. Um, where do you guys see television going from here? Like with XR kind of having its prime right now, especially with like the Katy Perry and the VMAs and AGT. Do you think that's going to stick? Do you think people are going to want an audience back in a theater again? Also, like, I mean, there's the evolution of drones too. Like, Bob, you use them in the Lady Gaga Super Bowl halftime show. Like, where is TV going? Uh, Michael, where do you think it's going? Well, I, I feel like if we knew that answer, we could be millionaires. Um, I mean, I think I think the big picture is that everyone wants the audience back. Uh, perhaps with the exception of those of us on this call. <laughs> but the, the producers, the artists, the, you know, the directors, they want that audience there. They want to see them reacting to what's happening on stage. Certainly there's a lot of benefit to not having them there and being able to schedule, you know, your, your, especially on a tape show, uh, your process kind of willy-nilly. But I think in the live variety sphere, uh, they're their in-person reaction is is definitely something that's missing um i think this all this in-camera stuff the xr the ar um i personally am kind of struggling with the with balancing the worth of how it looks with the amount of time that it takes uh i'm seeing i mean on agt for example which is the only thing i can speak to firsthand uh you know a three-minute performance took two to three to four hours to get done on XR, which is unheard of. I mean, normally something like that would have 90 minutes to an hour or to two hours on stage, maybe if we're lucky. So now as that technology gets better and people get faster at it, I'm, I'm sure it'll continue to be pervasive in the world. But I I think immediately we're, we're heading a little bit back towards where we were. Um, Bob, Jeff? Cheryl, and Cheryl, what do you guys say? <laughs> mm, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm actually more curious what your age group thinks about AR than, you know, I I told a producer once that I didn't think it was that impressive. And he said I was jaded. And I said, actually, I think I'm not jaded. I just think that the young audience that you're going for can do this on their iPad at home. And it's just looking like a video game doesn't have the same depth as or re show real people and and um i just i think you know i think for our vmas it works out perfectly video music awards you're going to kind of recreate the videos in some way i think that's fine i think it has its place but i don't think it's that impressive to be honest with you overall but I'm, i'd be actually more curious what your age group thinks if you're hungry for it then we're going to be doing it more because you're the future i agree so bob's turned the tables on you guys what do you think hannah you asked the question Sure. Um, I mean, like when I first saw the Katy Perry American Idol one, um, I, I, I liked the like interactivity between like she's at the edge of something and then there's nothing there, even though like she's on a stage. Right. But it made me believe it, even though it was super cartoony, um, if that makes sense. But and then I also loved it for the VMAs. But it's also something that like we haven't seen before on this type of show. So it, it, I don't know, I think it added something new and interesting, but yeah, I, I, I also think that we're going to want to return to having people there and like that kind of world. But I wonder if some parts of it will stay, like if certain performances will continue to have the XR or AR element and then others will just be purely them alone on a stage, you know? What does someone else think? Who, who wants to, who wants to weigh in? I'll jump in. I think oh. there's nothing that really compares to a live audience. The energy in the room with the performers as much for the audience it is for the performer as it is for the producers. I think I could see a world where AR and VR becomes an additive feature uh, because bands have already been streaming shows while they perform them even before COVID. I could see bands starting to incorporate AR or VR with someone on stage as the event's going on. So you could see from the guitarist perspective. Um, I'm not sure it will be a full-out replacement, and I really can't see it going that way. Yeah, yeah. I'm kind of on the boat as, uh, with uh, the other Philip as well. Um, 
because um, I, I, you know, like it's, it's just going to be another tool in the toolbox, you know, and I think that's kind of like the same thing we always have to kind of remember. Like everybody thought for the longest time that moving lights was going to replace static lights. And now with LEDs, everybody's like LEDs going to replace the, you know, arc and incandescence. And yeah, it, it's definitely going that kind of direction, but it's still another tool in the toolbox on how we want to engage and tell a story with the audience, you know? Mm-hmm. So I, I, I think it's, you know, I, I think it's 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 almost like it's almost uh, power creeping in a way to assume that like one technology is going to drastically affect you know the entire you know world of entertainment because people thought the same thing with film when you know when you know when you know when film was coming out everybody thought theater was going to die you know uh, Aristotle thought that uh, human memory was going to go to crap because we were writing and, you know, reading books as opposed to rem- memorizing, you know, the, the spoken word. So, you know, it's just another tool in the toolbox. That's, that, at least that's my opinion. Oh, man. I like that, Aristotle. Jake. Uh, Aristotle, to talk- you- yeah, Aristotle. <laughs> Sorry. I-, I was going to say, Bob, to talk to what you were saying, um, I thought it was interesting because you said that, especially with our generation, it's the kind of stuff that we have on our iPad. Um, and something that I've noticed is a trend within live entertainment and just across a lot of platforms is how um, oversaturated a lot of the technology we have is. So I have so much at my disposal already. So I think a big push that we'll probably see a lot of the industry going into is almost like who can do it who can one up each other um so how can we l- layer interactivity so you feel like you have autonomy over the situation um is where i start to see like example like the netflix series where you're interacting with the storyline the elements are going to be i think kind of the next jump for a lot of people of our age bracket yeah i i, I, I love to say the stuff's been super sophisticated there was just a show that uh, shot two weeks ago with AR, and uh, there was lights in the animation, and the lights were controlled by the lighting console. You could change color, you could change intensity, you know. So there, it's it's going a long way. But in the big picture, this question is really about live audiences. Um, there's going to be live shows. There's going to be live audiences and since we're allowed back in because it's there's nothing like the experience of being in the you know in the theater or in the venue of, of whatever it is. And that's where entertainment came from. And it's not going away because that experience can't be replaced with a television camera. Yeah. You can't it, share it the same way. Places, but it can't replace it, right? You're going to want to go to the theater as an audience member. And I think that a lot of yeah. what we do in the variety sphere, it's, you know, try to bring that live experience to the home viewer. So it is, it, it's not only creating an interesting television show for you to watch, but it's to put you at the Grammys, it's to put you at the VMAs, uh, but to give you the best seat in the house. So to give you that live experience, but give you something that you couldn't possibly see even if you were there. And then on this track, I want to ask about like two very different experiences. So Mike, you've lit a lot of award shows, you just mentioned a couple. And um, I want if maybe you would speak a little bit about the process of of lighting those kinds of productions, that that kind of one night live event process. Sure, I mean, I I would be remiss if I did not include Bob in this conversation, um, as as he well, is. I was going to ask Bob about shows, a different. But... <laughs> I was going to ask him about the Super Bowl halftime show, so it's a different kind of you know contrast, but but similar. Sure. So I think you know from a, a process standpoint, um, the these live shows that you know that the kind of one night events um the the planning starts far enough out like like a theater show would and we generally start with a big concept of what is the set you know what is screens what lights up what does not light up what moves what you know where do bands perform and we kind of establish you know a look for that show uh and what is that show's theme going to carry for this year and then where the challenge or the difference in like a music show versus something like the Oscars, for example, every artist that's coming on to the show wants to bring their own, you know, image to that, to that performance, to something that becomes iconic. 
Uh, so now we're designing not only the main show, but we're designing up to 26 additional performances. And oh, by the way, yeah. all of those artists are bringing with them a creative director, a lighting designer, a sound person, a costume person. Uh, so, you know, for something like the Grammys or, you know, Bob could speak to the VMAs, like you, you are almost becoming this uh, funnel of information of trying to, you know, take these 26 individual ideas and make them all work. Uh, in the sandbox that you've created, um, while also trying to put your own spin on the thing. That's so right. you know, you're you're a servant of of many masters as a as a lighting designer of a project like that. And then, yeah, Bob, I was going to ask you about you know we talked about stress earlier and detaching, and I I think about uh, the the iconic Super Bowl halftime shows which you've been involved in, and I think wow that's stressful. Um, but what about that process? I mean, you, you've got something that, that only appears for a moment of time and then kind of dissolves into thin air. Yeah, I mean, the, the most obvious thing that makes that job more stressful than a normal show that we do is it hasn't loaded in yet. It's, it's, <laughs> it's four city blocks low with over 500 to 800 people waiting for someone to say, the field's yours, and then seven and a half minutes you live around the world. So. That, you know, people ask you on Sunday because you're waiting around forever. You have to get there really early to get you know, in front of everything. So you're there at 10 a.m. for what's probably going to be a 7.30 p.m., you know, halftime show. And people are like, you feel good? Are you ready? I'm like, no, I don't feel good. <laughs> I'm like, I feel good. We're, it's, it's, put it in. it's sitting over here under tarps and it's raining. No, I don't feel good. I'm not, you know, and even when the show is over, like, how to go? I'm like, I have no idea. I was calling spot cues and looking for problems and everything else and, the, you know, Next thing you know, your set's running off the field. So that show's got its own stress that is unique to itself. It's a hard show to explain to the most seasoned veteran if you haven't been there. But the uh, logistics is you're occupying, you know, 13.2 minutes um, in the middle of the largest American sporting event. Uh, so although the NFL has come to embrace us, I would say, in the last 10 years, we're still just the halftime show, stay out of the way. So no matter where you hang a light or run a cable, it's got to be super approved and basically undetectable to the fans. Um, so your lighting systems get super limited. And it doesn't matter that they could get $10,000 for the seat. I've offered them $100,000 for 10 seats before. They don't care what they want. <laughs> they want the people in the seat. So I can't just get any spot position I want or anything like that. Now, again, it's gotten a lot better in about the last 10 years where the company that the NFL hires to make the Super Bowl happen, which is a massive project inside and outside the stadium, they're super cooperative with us and they do what they can, but they cannot just give us perfect 50-yard line seats. Um, so you've got that logistic issue. Just getting into the parking lot with your rental car is a, is a massive process um, with security and everything else, let alone getting into your proper compound and then to go in and out of the stadium from your compound to the stadium every day and going through another series of security checks, just constant. Um, the logistics of that show, it just is super difficult. And if you happen to catch uh, the article, I can't remember which magazine it was, but this year, because grass doesn't grow in Miami, they had 70, 700,000 watts of green grow lights on the field 24 hours a day. So while we're trying to program in the stadium and pick color, my basic white color palette was primary green. Because that's what I was dealing with. So, and it's just not like you get to go up and say, turn off the freaking grow lights for one night. Or it's going to be two hours about the grow lights on, please, so I can get through this. So then you add that into this year, we usually get a little kind of sneak peek of the set Tuesday night when all of what we call volunteers or not push the set on to the field once and they all look at it and then they take it off and they go back out and we're here's my partner. Well, we take that 15 minutes while it's sitting there. We get all of our focuses on the stage to sometimes see it. Well, we didn't get Tuesday. Wednesday is rehearsal with only our cameras, not the 50 Super Bowl cameras, so only our nine cameras. So we get Wednesday night. We usually have Thursday, that's our big day. They canceled that because they said the field was too damaged. And we got two passes Friday. So going into this year's Super Bowl, it was just stressed out to the max because we had never loaded in on time. They'd only tried it twice. They never got in on time. So we're like, well, it's not going to make it on time. You know, it might make it on time. We won't get another commercial. So in the opening thing that happens is a giant light cue from the, all the lights on the floor. So you're like, oh, here we go. You know, and they weren't working all the way through the count. Um, the um, 
board operators put all their lights in a like a, a test sequence. So they're all panning and tilting. And this year, for whatever reason, they chose red, white, and blue. And they're all circulating red, white, and blue so that the crew can quickly look over and I can look from the truck on high shots and see if I see a problem. Somebody's not paying tilting, somebody's not changing color and call it out. But at some point in time, when time code runs, we've got to take the gig. So when we pulled in, when we pulled up the time code this year, the whole front part of the bottom circle, if you remember the show, hadn't calibrated. So it's like. <laughs> 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 Different yeah. level of stress. <laughs> Constantly listening on your headset, which is true about any one of the jobs that we all do, Jeff, Mike, all of us do. You're constantly on headset listening for any chirp of a problem. And nobody <laughs> talks on headset during a halftime show at all. Because if that headset opens, that means there's a problem. They've got to be super clear about what it is. And every show has had a massive problem. Like we lost the front of house headsets to all the follow spot operators for Bruno Mars. Never, never got them back. So I was calling cell phones in the last 60 seconds of the count, saying, just do it rehearsed Friday. Don't get nervous. <laughs> so, you know, so, you know, something's always going to happen. So it's just like this massive stressor where you're sitting on needles waiting to hear somebody that's like spot two just blew up. You know, that's what you're waiting to hear. So it's hard. I, to yeah, I think, I, I think that one of the biggest challenges or, or like, the things that I find most exciting about the live shows is like we, as Bob said, you really only do it once. So you're not only like when you're sitting down and listening to them count back from 10, it's it's not a like, OK, what is my job? Like, what are the follow spots that I have to call? It is the what happens when I lose this follow spot? What do I do? What happens when we lose, you know, this console or this whatever or they don't get this thing on? Like you're in your head kind of redesigning the show as you go in case something happens. Cause there is no hold, there is no go back and do it again. You've got to get something on air. Um, and that's like, that is the thing that, that makes, that kind of keeps me coming back. It's, it, you know, a little bit like a drug addiction. Uh <laughs> that goes back to the first question of why we don't sleep. And once I wake up, I'm awake. <laughs> <laughs> but I think also Bob, one one thing I didn't want to let go past that you had mentioned, which I think is is unique to the theater people on the call, is the idea of killing seats. Um, that you know when you do a televised show, uh, even if it is something that was made for stage and then comes live, one of the first questions that you have to or, or things that you have to do as a lighting person is talk about you know where your follow spots are going to go and if you need any positions that are front of house and what seats those kill and for bob that's a huge thing on halftime because that those decisions have to be made likely before you even know the artist but yeah. anytime you go into yeah exactly uh, you know, um we you know we we have to go into a venue and try and figure out where a follow spot can go and often it can't go where the venue thinks they belong uh, they're they're far too steep for what we would be looking for. Uh, so that's that's a thing that you have to, you know, play the politics of as a designer too. What what do we need to kill for this show? What is the director killing for their camera? What is the production designer killing for the set? And then making sure there's still enough seats available to do whatever the production requires. We also yeah we like the venue right the venue is scenery it's going to be on camera so we do something that a lot of you don't think about we like the venue we like the audience and you know something cheryl brought up earlier was she goes we go in and we got you know 100 questions and it's funny is i wrote an app with 2,000 questions on it it was all departments lighting through audio you'd go in on your ipad and it's like do i need to remove seats for a light board yes what are the seats do you need steel deck to put them on that was and right before i got someone to actually make it a real app and program i thought what am i an idiot i'm going to put this app out and I'm going to get 10,000 emails every day. Like, why can't it do this? And why can't it do that? <laughs> scrap the entire thing. I scrapped the entire thing just because of it. But it's a good thing to have a list. Like, start making a list for yourself. If you would keep a book of things that you should ask on a, on a survey, where do all the empty boxes go? You know, if it's long term, they're going to go back to the shop. But keep up. The other thing I would suggest, which I would have done, but I'm, now it's too late. But I wouldn't mind you doing a little bit of a diary for yourself. When you do get stressed on a job, and then, but the job then goes well, write out that you're stressed. Uh oh, today's show day, super stressed out, super worried about this. What if my key light burns out? And then when the show's over and you've kind of calmed down, go back and read that and follow up. I got through it. 
it didn't seem like I was going to have enough time, but I got through it because honestly, I have to remind myself all the time when I'm getting in the middle of a, just a horrible scheduled show that, wait, I've had worse. I've gotten through it. We're still going to make a good look out of this. Right. But I think, you know, if I'd kept it, I'd be very curious what I would have said 20 years ago about a show that was stressing me out to what I would say now. I'd still get stressed, but I'd, I'd be curious on how I handle it. Yep. That's, that's really good advice. I love that. Ad- yeah, I love that advice. Uh, and I'm, I'm curious as we're, we're rounding into our final 15 minutes here, we're going to open the floor for more questions. But I'm also curious if, uh, if any of the other you, Cheryl, Mike, uh, uh, Jeff, I think is probably still with us, probably focusing right now. Um, right. If you have specific advice like Bob just offered, it would be interesting to offer that because I think that's a great one. Um, and then I, I will ask one final question from my side, and then we'll go to the students, and then we'll we'll go to your advice. And that is about the process of actually getting work. I mean, I think a lot of things that we think about when we're getting out of school is how will I get work? And I know that's different uh, for you guys independent. Um, Cheryl, you work as part of a larger firm, but what could you lend to the students about the process of work coming to you? Uh, Cheryl, I'll start with you. One of the easiest things, I think I think Michael said it before, um, that I highly recommend always is if you work with somebody um, or you're do a portfolio review and somebody reviews your portfolio at a, at a convention or some, something like that, follow up. Thank that person for their time. Remind them who you are so that then later when you're reaching out to them again, say, you know, it meant so much to me that time that, that you had, that you, you talked to me and I, and I put that into practice and I'd, I'd love to even just pick your brain. But if, you know, if, you have, you know, if you're ever looking for anything, keep that channel open. Um, I'm really rather introverted and I'm not good at that. And I, and I think that's why I fit so well in a larger firm, but especially coming right out of school, don't forget to send that thank you email and and keep in touch because we, we remember those people that followed up. Um, I've, I've taken student groups on tours of, of studios in, in New York, um, 30 to 50 people. And I maybe get two emails back and I remember those those students. And those are the students, when I get their resumes, I say, take a look at this guy's, this, this, this kid's, you know, got something like, and they, they remembered. And so that's, that's the number, number one. And it's such an easy thing to do. That's great. I think it's, you answered my question and you also gave good advice. So thanks for covering both of those. Mike, what's your take on that? Getting work, the process of work coming to you. Yeah, so I think as as someone that is coming out of school, the best thing that you can do is reach out to people whose work you admire uh, and and whose jobs you admire, especially in the television industry. I I think there is a there's a bounty of work in our world. I think almost everyone on this call would say that they're they're working more than they want to, maybe with the exception of this year. Um, but we're almost always looking for people and specifically looking for interns as well. Like that I got my job being an intern. I do my best to try and give those opportunities whenever possible to other people as well. And what you see from interns coming in is people very immediately either are interested in the job or are not interested in the job. And frankly, that experience is worth it to give to both of those people. If if you get someone that doesn't wanna do this and, and they spent a week with you and they've seen the process and they, they've learned that it's not for them, that's that's as worth it as finding someone who is you know the next lighting designer that's gonna be great in this industry. Um, like Cheryl was saying about following up, uh, I, I would apply that you know not only to thank you notes, but also to like, if you reach out to me uh, via email, and I don't get back to you, it's probably not because I don't want to get back to you. It's likely because I got the email when I was busy and it's now buried 500 emails down later. Uh, so I, I say I say this not as an email every day, but uh, don't be afraid to to be the squeaky wheel. Uh, that that generally indicates that it is if if you're if you're willing to ping me a couple times to get a job, I know that you're going to do the same thing for me as an uh, as an intern or as an associate to people who are around uh, on the job itself. Enthusiasm is infectious, right? Yeah, go, go ahead, Bob, speak yeah. further. 
I do not want to be your enthusiasm. I don't have to say, Jake, come to work and have a good time, would you? I don't want to get into it. I want, you know, Melanie showing up like earlier than I get there because I want to know that you want to be there. You can't fake enthusiasm. And I go back to attitude, work ethic, and personality because it makes up what your reputation is. And you're hired on your reputation. For the rest of your life, you're going to get hired because of your reputation. Your reputation is what other people think of you. And the only way we can have a reputation is to get known so that people think of us. And then you're thinking, well, then how do I get work if I'm not known? I don't care about you getting work right now. I know you do. But what I would care about is summing up what everybody has just said to you is if you find somebody's work interesting, email's so great, right? You can write, write an email and the person can just delete it, never hang up on you. And just say, look, I, I find what you're doing is interesting. I might get into this part of the business. I would love to pick your brain for 10 minutes, ideally in person when those things are available again, but if not on the phone or if they're willing to do a Zoom, but they probably won't. Um, but interview them. Don't ask for a job. Their answer is going to be no. It's a yes or no question. The answer is going to be no, because they're going to hire someone they know, or at least hire someone that comes in with a friend's recommendation. So what we're looking for is to get known. So we want to interview them. We're going to ask how they got started, what advice they have for us. And what we're doing by doing that is we're actually introducing ourselves to you. And we're starting to get a reputation with you. And then we're going to go over to Dave, and I'm going to email Dave, and I'm going to say the same thing to David. And David's then going to say, Hey, I just talked to this girl named Melanie. Did she talk to you? It's like, yeah, well, now they can talk about you. Now you're getting a reputation. And the worst thing they're going to do is delete the email. The best thing they're going to do is going to give you some time. And then the next best thing they might just say, if the conversation's going well, hey, do you think I could come down? You said you were focusing a show next Tuesday. Any chance I could just come down and watch that? I, I would just love to, you know, understand what you do. Now they get to meet you. Now they get to see you. You have enthusiasm. You have a good attitude, a good personality. I don't recommend that you look at their assistant and say, I'm going to have your job someday. That's probably not a good move. Um, but it is, you know, we're just out there. You're going to meet all these people. Look, you might get into a conversation where somebody goes, you know, this is what I do all day. I mean, I manage, you know, I, I, Michael will agree, you know, we're, we're lighting designers, but Cheryl tells you what we do because, you know, we do have somebody in the office who uh, does a lot of what Cheryl does. But on site, I'm managing the lighting department. I'm the clown with the barrel keeping the bull, which is called a producer or a director, away from my cowboy, which is my programmer, so that they have time to program. I'm managing my department to pull off what I was asked to pull off. I'm not lighting that much. You really want to light? Get behind the board. But you might find that out. Okay. I only want to light, so I don't want to do what you know, Bob and Michael and Cheryl do. I don't want to just manage. I want to light. So if you want to light, then get behind a console, which is fine, and it's great, and it's super creative. And I know people as Michael and Jeff know people that that's all they're ever going to do. Yeah. They're super happy right there. They're one isolated level off of having to talk to management and they're lighting all day. But reach out to people, ask to talk to them, introduce yourself. That's how you're going to get work. You're going to get work with your reputation and your enthusiasm. Wow, that's a great, great bunch of answers, guys. I really appreciate your enthusiasm for that. And then I'm going to open it to the students for a kind of a final round of questions. We've got another five minutes. And Emma, I saw you raise your hand quickly. Um, are there any like resources or books at all? Or how Cheryl said in the beginning, you were reading equipment catalogs um, just to learn the equipment better. Um, or just besides just going on Google and just trying to learn as much as you can. Is there any specific resources that you have in mind? I'm gonna give you one before we get an answer from others. Uh, right at the beginning, Bob mentioned Bill Clagis. And uh, about 12 years ago, Bill came to, to Middleton and did a lighting masterclass for the camera for us in Middleton. And we we videotaped it and we kind of we did what we do we videotaped it it sat on a hard drive somewhere and just a month or so ago we pulled it back out and started editing it so pretty soon we will publish um uh bill's lighting masterclass which i think is a it, it, it is i've i've seen it it's a masterpiece it's fantastic so we'll we'll have one of those up for you soon Emma. but then other resources that you guys could think of jeff's coming out with a book I'm plugging Jeff. It's got a book coming out, and it's dealing with everything between live and television and everything else in his experience. 
No, AC still on mute, so he may have gone away. But yes, Jeff does have a book. I don't. Um, I, I don't particularly have a book. I, I would say that if you're curious in television lighting, then I would um, study shows that you like, write down questions that come up. So when you take that opportunity to go interview some people that do it, you can get firsthand feedback on what it is you were questioning so much. What did you found so interesting? I, I just, I mean, if you're in the drafting, of course, I mean, if you, you know, there's a lot of your first jobs in redrafting. I would highly recommend drafting a light plot. Make up light plots. Pull a light plot off of um, light, light design online and redraft it. You don't have to have the exact mm -hmm. idea. Get fast at drafting so that when someone gives you an opportunity to draft, you're not thinking of the mechanics of drafting. You're thinking of the creativity of where you could be helping to put lights. Everybody that drafts for myself, and, and I'm sure Michael, who used to do a lot of drafting. Um, you know, I, I'm working on this big show that's going to be at the Staples Arena. And I just gave the guy just a very slight direction on round one. And he's already come back with his version of the light plot. And now we're going to go through it. And we're going to you know keep sanding it down and keep sanding it down until we get within budget and we find a creative approach. But that's how I work with people. So you could get better at drafting. You could get better at any paperwork skills that you might do, whether it be Excel or Light Right. I think honing all those skills would be good. But literature, I don't, I don't know. That's because I can't read. The joke. Well, and, and I think Bob, what Bob was saying about the live design stuff. Most of the sh the big shows that we work on, uh, those PDFs are all online mm -hmm. as far as light plots go, and they are accessible to you. And I, I think you will likely find more questions than answers by looking at them. Uh, but again, that's a, a perfectly reasonable email to start. Like, hey, I saw your light plot in live design and I had a question about why you did this. Um, it's a great conversation starter. And again, gen like right now when I'm sitting at home not doing a whole lot, happy to answer those emails. And even if I'm busy, that shows me that you've gone a step further than just figuring out you know, watching the credits of a show to figure out who did something. Right. Um, so it's, a, it's a, a good place to start. There's also a lot of online resources these days, especially this year. Folks that are at home and not working as much are, are putting up YouTube videos, how to, how to light, you know, your home studio, um, that, um, that even those little bits can be translated into, into a bigger picture uh, or into a bigger plot. Just the, the same concepts on a smaller scale. Um, and a lot of the manufacturers um, have or are now um, doing um, stuff like this where they've um, where they've got in shops as well where they where they're doing uh, sessions with different designers or um, or gaffers or, or whatever or even just explaining a new piece of technology that they're putting out there and how they hope you're going to use it and um, that can open up those doors for you then to again like Michael said ask questions. Um, and, and dig into it, um, and then and then when when we're back to meeting in person, and you and you head to NAB or LDI or any of those, um, you know, can get expensive. Pick one class each year to go to, to to brush up on something, and and even there you'll meet more people that you can then ask more questions of. So it, it's there's so many different ways to get in get get that knowledge, but um, definitely definitely reach out to the, the folks that are dis that are making the next thing um you know our, our feedback can can go into whatever that next fixture that's being made and and make it better and, and i think i think that it, you know it's, it's not just you know lights being made for us but uh to use but also you know what purpose do you see that you might need it so the that education can go both ways well I want to thank everyone for their time. This has been a fantastic session and uh, we're 90 minutes in. I know that these designers have uh, got to get back to worrying about their shows, um, which is what they what they do in the evening, right? Uh, and I know that you guys have, have got uh, work to do as well. So um, there will be additional sessions on, on uh, other areas of lighting. And then we move into a phase of more of the smaller social sessions. So you will get a chance to talk to these designers again in uh, the smaller social setting environments. But I really want to thank um, uh, Bob, Cheryl, Mike, and Jeff. Um, what a treasure trove of information. So you have our, our honor this evening. Thank you.
And uh, to the students, uh, great job on the questions, and we will uh, look forward to seeing you. If you have um, if you have questions for me, you can always email me. If you'd like to make contact directly with one of the designers, if you don't have their email addresses, we'll make sure and, and get them to you. So thanks, everyone. Jeff, good luck on your show. I hope you're not working too late. But I guess you're, you're on Pacific time. So. I can't. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, we'll end on that note, and um, we really appreciate you guys taking the time to connect with us today.